Hi, folks. Welcome. We'll be starting uh, the webinar promptly at 2, and we'll be back at you. We'll uh, just waiting for people to join up. Thanks. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live session, Pressure Sewer System Design Using E1's Design Assistance Software. I'm Rachel Seiler, today's host and Marketing Communications Manager for E1. Before we get started, I do have some housekeeping notes. All attendee lines have been muted. We'll be recording today's session, and an archived edition will be available on E1's website and on our YouTube channel. Upon successful completion of today's webinar, you'll receive a PDF of this presentation, a link to download said software, design assistant, and a certificate of attendance. And finally, we'd love to hear from you. We've allotted about 10 minutes of Q&A during today's session, so please make use of that feature. And if we don't get to all your questions, we'll answer them in a follow-up email. So now, without further delay, I'd like to introduce today's presenter, Derek Latchett, Director of Engineering for E1. Derek has worked with E1 for more than 10 years and has been involved with project management, sales, pre and post sales support, local manufacturing support, and contract management. Derek was involved in many pressure sewer projects in Australia and New Zealand, including Mornington Peninsula where 16,000 properties are undergoing a septic to sewer conversion. Derek, take it away. Thank you, Rachel. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining me today. Uh, during today's session, we'll review using E1's free design assistance software to help you better perform a preliminary design of a pressure sewer system or help better explain the outputs of a design you may have received from E1. Let's get started. Before we dive into the details, I want to take a few minutes to briefly introduce Environment One or E1 for those that might not be aware. E1 and pressure sewers have existed for over 50 years. We are a US based company and our headquarters is in Niska Una, New York, about two to three hours north of New York City. Our facility is over 75,000 square feet and we have over 140 employees. The facility is the main center for design, engineering, manufacture of all the equipment. E1 is predominantly involved in pressure sewer systems. E1 is also involved in the energy sector through the design, engineering, and manufacture of hydrogen systems for power plants. These two industries support critical infrastructure. The history of E1 begins with the development of the concept of pressure sewer systems. In the 1960s, what became the US EPA and the American Society of Civil Engineers were tasked with solving some challenging problems in wastewater collection systems. Through their work, the concept of the household appliance to perform the task was conceived. Engineers from General Electric were engaged to help. The same GE that manufactures jet engines, medical imaging equipment, locomotives, etc. GE also manufactures household appliances, and engineers from that department developed the first sewage grinder pump for pressure sewer systems. After the completion of the project, GE was not interested in commercializing the grinder pump. However, Engineers working on the project saw great potential. They purchased the intellectual property from GE and founded E1 in 1969. From those humble beginnings, E1 has become the dominant global market leader in pressure sewers. E1 leads the global market that we invented, and today we have an established global installation base, over 700,000 units manufactured globally. Another way to look at this is over 2.5 million people rely on E1 pressure sewers every day. Fundamentally, our mission at E1 is to spread awareness of pressure sewers as an appropriate solution for wastewater collection. One of the key ways we like to spread the awareness is to engage all project stakeholders at an early stage and discuss how the system can be designed. We provide design assistance at a preliminary level to develop a budget cost which can be evaluated against other options because ultimately most decisions are based around cost. E1 strives to earn the title of trusted advisor when it comes to pressure sewers. E1 leverages decades of experience to provide solutions to simple and challenging problems. 
not all solutions may be easy or what you want to hear, but it's this honest and transparent relationship that it's the foundation of trust. Finally, we establish relationships for life with all customers. Our singular focus on pressure sewer necessitates that every project is successful. We're here today to review the approach to designing E1 pressure sewer systems. Let's review some of the key points of the process. Before considering using any software packages, we need to ensure we have all the relevant information for our inputs. This is a critical step since the quality of the output of the design is a function of the quality and accuracy of the input. The next step is to break the project site into smaller segments or zones. Each zone is examined separately and then the analysis considers how the zones operate together. This webinar does not review the zone division process in detail. If you need help understanding what zones are, when they occur, check out the Design and Application of Pressure Sewer webinar hosted by yours truly. This webinar is available on E1's YouTube page or linked at E1's website. Next, a total dynamic head or TDH calculation is performed to ensure the grinder pumps can operate within the network given friction losses and elevation changes. The network pipe sizing is selected for each zone and modified to ensure a sufficient flow velocity is achieved and to minimize the retention time within the pipe. The best news is that all of these calculations and modifications are easily performed using E1 Design Assistant. The E1 design method is referred to as the probability method. This method is based on a statistical model developed from empirical data. It shows that given a number of pumps, there will be a statistical maximum number of pumps operating simultaneously. The statistical model is what creates the table shown on this slide, the maximum number of simultaneous operations. So given a number of total pumps in the left column, there will be a maximum number of pumps operating in the right column. So if there are 100 pumps, the statistical model states that a maximum number of eight will be operating simultaneously. So again, if there's 100 pumps in a zone, eight will be operating simultaneously. Another critical assumption and element of the E1 design approach is a consistent flow rate from each pump. A positive displacement pump delivers a relatively consistent flow regardless of system pressure. This allows for a linear relationship between the number of simultaneous operations and flow rate. Back to our example, with 100 pumps, eight will be operating simultaneously, and the flow rate of each pump is approximately 11 gallons per minute, regardless of that system pressure. That means I know the flow rate to the network will be eight times 11 or 88 gallons per minute. This becomes the basis for other calculations like velocity and total dynamic head. As a note, the simultaneous operation method cannot be used with systems incorporating other types of grinder pumps, specifically centrifugal grinder pumps. The SIMOPS method was developed by E1 and has been utilized for decades. This method is codified by regulators around the world, used daily by E1 and countless others, and the methodology is defensible and supported by historical and modern real-time field data. First, gathering project details are critical to an accurate design. As listed on this slide, the key inputs are as follows. A layout of the area to be served, showing individual lots or properties. This should also include a graphic scale or some method so we can accurately measure pumping distance. A general estimate of the sewage flow per property. This can be based on actual or, or standards for a particular area. Uh, the pipe type uh, and, and generally uh, accepted is the use of SDR 11 HDPE. Uh, topographical information, so we know if there are any hills in the area and a discharge location. You know, finally, it's useful to understand any region specific information such as climate, code regulations, which may impact pipe sizing or other relevant information. Uh, one example could be uh, a known or future potential for surrounding development. For instance, vacant land adjacent to a project site may be considered for future development. This could be taken into account and provisions investigated to allow that future development into the same pipe network. So now that we have our project information, we understand the assumptions, we can begin the design process. The design process is a combination of one, manual work, creation of the zones, measuring zone lengths, understanding elevations, 
two, data entry into Design Assistant, and three, interpreting the outputs from Design Assistant. Design Assistant, as described, is an assistant. The software performs many of the calculations to provide the user with insight into flow rates, velocity within the pipe network, and the pressure or total dynamic head. You can perform these same calculations with a pencil and paper, a calculator, or with a spreadsheet. Design Assistant comes prepared to do the calculations for you. Design Assistant performs a series of iterative calculations and outputs the ideal pipe size for a particular zone to maximize system longevity. All of these functions, plus other commercial considerations, are packaged by Design Assistant into a report or a study package. Now, any discussion about what something does wouldn't be complete without a discussion about what it doesn't do. Design Assistant does not design this system for you. The system does not create the zones, and the software assumes consistent flow and doesn't perform any sort of dynamic flow modeling. Furthermore, since Design Assistant utilizes the SIMOPS flow assumption, Design Assistant does not change the number of pumps operating based on more flow from a dwelling or a connection. The simultaneous operations is only a function of the number of connections. Design Assistant is utilized for designing the pipe network and does not design pump stations or provide sizing of grinder pump stations. If you need help with station sizing, contact E1 or your local E1 distributor. Right, okay, now the best way to learn, in my opinion, is by doing. So let's look at an example. The image on the right is a representation of a coastal development with connections located on various roads, and the discharge point is marked towards the upper right. Each property is represented by an open circle, and the small line connecting the circle to the main is a representation of the inch and a quarter or 40 millimeter pipe that connects the grinder pump station to the main. The hydraulic losses through that pipe are considered to be negligible in our assumptions. Generally, the E1 assumptions are conservative enough to absorb minor losses from that section of pipe as well as friction losses due to fittings or direction changes. So the first step is to ensure we have all the project information. From the image, we have the project layout to be service check. Uh, we have a method to measure distance. We have our graphical scale, or if a, if a CAD model is available, we can scale directly from the CAD model. Uh, we know where we're discharging, um, and we know where hills are. For clarity, this image does not show any contour lines, but again, that information is provided and known. Um, zone designations are shown in the numbered blue circles, and again, we're not going to get into the process of that zone designation process, and if you need some help there, make sure you refer to other resources from E1. Okay, so now let's get going with Design Assistant. After opening E1 Design Assistant, we're first presented with the Project Information tab. Here, we enter relevant information that can help you keep organized. Also, this information will appear on the reports that are printed from Design Assistant. On this page, you can also input project-specific notes for, for, the, for the client or the audience, such as the assumptions or recommendations that you've made. Perhaps the most important selection on this page is to choose the units and voltage frequency for the project region. For example, a project in New York, USA would use US units and 60 hertz frequency versus a project, say, in Sydney, Australia would use metric units and 50 hertz. Finally, maybe a combination of the two, a project in Ontario, Canada might use metric units and 60 hertz frequency. A word of warning, once you begin inputting zone information into the following screens, the units do become fixed and can't be changed without starting a new project. As we continue navigating Design Assistant, you can select different functions using the icons in the menu bar. From left to right, we see the project information, which we just reviewed, and then the compass and square represent the uh, design information. And not surprisingly, the bills and coins are where you put project cost information, and then we see reports and, and uh, price descriptions. So on. we'll talk more about each of these in, in the coming slides. From the design information function, the first table is used to input zone information. And to help make sure during this webinar we're on the same page, I've, I've color coded the column descriptions on the left to the colored boxes around the columns on the right. So the first zone uh, is zone number, and that's really an identifier or reference for the software. Next, the connects to 
column directs the program which column connects connects to which. Uh, for example, we see zone one connects to zone two. If we look at our, our diagram, we see zone one connects to zone two. Likewise, zone two connects to zone three. At this point, we have a branch connection uh, and we see that zone four and zone three both connect to five. And, and again, that's shown here. One connects to two, two connects to three, three connects to five, also four connects to five and so on and so forth. Uh, finally, on the slide, we input the number of pumps in each zone. And again, that's covered uh, in, in, other, uh, in other resources where we create those zone designations. So why does zone one have three pumps and zone two have six pumps? Uh, but that information is, is input into each, of these, into each of these slides, or excuse me, into each of these fields. Next, we input the maximum flow per pump. And this value can be auto-filled or the user can select a value from the E1 grinder pump performance curve. The general guidance is to provide a fixed value as an initial input. And that value is usually midway up the performance curve. And in general, the default will be uh, 11 gallons per minute in the US units. And, and there's other similar defaults for metric and 50 Hertz. Next, we, uh, we input daily flow per connection. And my example is in US units and shows a default of 200 gallons per day. Uh, your region may provide values greater or less than this. Uh, and this value is used to calculate the maximum retention time of sewage in the pipeline. Again, this value will not impact the frequency of pump operations and therefore flow rate. The only thing that impacts flow rate is the number of simultaneous operations. The final column on the screen uh, is zone length, and, and this is measured or scaled from that drawing and entered, again, in feet or meters, depending on the project units. And this value will be used in our friction loss calculation and also helps build a bill of materials in the finished report. The final columns on the zone information tab were asked to input maximum main elevation in the zone and the minimum pump elevation. This provides the static head or lift required. Static head is a simple subtraction of the maximum main elevation and the minimum pump elevation. We'll talk more about that uh, later. The maximum main elevation is generally the downstream high point in the zone. And the minimum pump elevation is the minimum pump elevation anywhere in that zone. Design Assistant does have some intelligence and will automatically correct for any high points in downstream zones that are higher than the high point in that particular zone. If a grinder pump station is going to be sited above the main elevation, which is possible, the best practice is to use the main elevation for both values. This will ensure that we don't calculate negative static head. E1 grinder pumps can efficiently and effectively pump downhill without causing damage. However, it's be best practice not to assume negative static heads or effectively take credit for downhill pumping. This assumption simplifies calculations and avoids some risks and uncertainty of flow in that downhill section. Let's keep going. Before we move uh, on, off from the uh, zone information page, I wanted to point out some other inputs or options. First, the red circle drop down menu allows the user to select the, the pipe type. Um, there are a variety of options available. E1 strongly recommends SDR11 HDPE uh, for its durability, reliability, and availability, but there's other options available. The blue circle is the input for the C factor or pipe roughness factor. This factor is used in the calculation of the friction or resistance to flow of the liquid as it travels through the pipe. The coefficient is typically available from resources, including uh, pipe manufacturers, engineering standards, uh, even different, different regions have this as a, as a codified standard. E1 prefers to use 150 to 160 for HDPE, which is provided from the Plastic Pipes Institute, an industry trade organization for plastic pipe. Finally, the green circle shows the default flow per day per dwelling. This value will vary based on the units. And, and this is the, the value that auto fills into the zone information column. And really this option allows the user to make a universal or global change uh, to that default. Uh, so now we're essentially done with uh, our design assistant inputs. Uh, time to let the computer start doing the work. Um, so staying on the design assistant, uh, the design information function, we have three different tabs. And up until now, we've just been inputting our project data into the zone information tab. Next, we're gonna explore uh, the, the blue circled area or design tab 
design page one, which will calculate the head loss and velocity, along with providing us our first glimpse of recommended pipe sizes. Design page two includes the calculation for retention time, or essentially how long it takes for the sewage to reach the discharge location. More on that to follow. On design page one, the first few columns are a repeat of the information provided in the zone information tab. The fourth column in green is the accumulated pumps in zone, which is the sum of the pumps in that particular zone and any pumps from upstream zone, which will flow through that current zone. Uh, for example, the accumulated pumps in zone two are nine because we have six pumps in this zone and we also have all three pumps from zone one pumping through it. So that's our accumulated pumps in zone. The maximum number of simultaneous operation column auto completes from a look up to the SIMOPS table. Um, I, I'm not gonna jump back to that table, but um, for example, in zone three, there are uh, 18 accumulated pumps. If we go to the simultaneous operations table, a range of 10 to 18 pumps will have a maximum number of simultaneous operations of four. Likewise, for zone six, 47 pumps. On the SIMOPS table, the range of 31 to 50 pumps will have a maximum number of simultaneous operations of six. The design assistant program does this lookup for you, but it's important to understand the origin of this number. Finally, the max flow column is the simple uh, uh, multiplication of the number of simultaneous operations by the default flow rate from each pump. From the example shown on the screenshots on previous page, the default flow rate was 11 gallons per minute. Therefore, the maximum flow in zone one with two simultaneous operations is two times 11 or 22 gallons per minute. Each zone gets that same calculation completed. Let's see what's next on design page one. Ah, we finally made it. Congratulations, everyone. I hope you're patting yourselves on the back. Pipe size recommendations, how exciting. Check out the red column. In the background, Design Assistant is performing a variety of calculations and iterations to output the ideal pipe size, which will ensure system longevity. Uh, that isn't to say there are other pipe sizes that, that won't work, but, uh, or that, that'll work, but uh, the default given from Design Assistant is the E1 recommendation. The pipe size column has a drop down menu, which allows the user to modify the pipe sizing and observes the impact to velocity and total dynamic head. The green column is velocity in the zone and velocity is a calculation performed by design assistant. Design assistant considers the flow rate through that zone and the inner diameter of the selected pipe in that zone. Velocity calculation utilizes a dimensional analysis really to convert the inputs into common outputs. What I mean, for example, in the US, the flow rate is typically represented as gallons per minute. However, the velocity is typically represented in feet per second. The velocity calculation converts the inputs into the outputs. More about the velocity calculation will be discussed later. Zone length is, is simply shown in blue and it comes directly from the zone information tab. Friction loss factor per 100 units is, is really an incremental step in determining friction loss. And, and this is the purple column and, and we'll talk more about that. Um, the final yellow column is the friction loss in that zone. Uh, this is the friction loss factor per 100 units multiplied by the number of 100 units in that zone. Maybe that's a little confusing. So let's look at zone one. Zone one is 205 feet. Another way to look at that is we have 2.05 lengths of 100 foot pipe right there. So in, to get the friction loss in that zone, we multiply the friction loss per 100 feet times 2.05. And if you got your calculator right there, uh, it, it should come up with 2.44. Maybe one that's a little bit easier. If we go to, um, if we go to zone six, it's 1000 feet long, or there's 10 sections of 100 foot pipe. So we multiply 10 by 1.38 and with a little bit of rounding error, that's where the friction loss comes from in, in that particular zone. Uh, we'll review some of the uh, calculations that design assistant uses in detail. So design assistant calculations use commonly accepted equations to de determine velocity and friction loss. Again, velocity equations are really just a dimensional analysis to convert the flow rate 
into velocity. With these equations, the flow rate and inner diameter of the pipe is known, and we are solving for the velocity in meters per second when using metric units or feet per second. For friction loss, the software uses the modified Hazen-Williams equation. The equations are shown, and Hazen-Williams is a simple and reliable method for determining friction loss with fluid flow in a pipe. Other methods exist, but Hazen-Williams equation provides the quickest results uh, with the highest level of accuracy for pressure sewers. The equations shown, shown here are well documented, available from a variety of sources, including E1, and you can find them on the internet or like me, uh, your favorite dusty textbook. Let's keep going. Carrying on with the rest of the columns from design page one. The accumulated friction loss in red is simply the sum of the friction loss in that one zone and any downstream zones. So we need to consider the friction loss that each zone contributes to flow. What this ends up meaning is that the accumulated friction loss uh, will typically always be greatest at the point farthest from the discharge. If you think about it, the flow from zone one, uh, in, our, in our case, has to travel the longest. It has the most pipe to travel through before it gets to the discharge point. So the it's going to be subjected to the most friction. And you see that, you see that on our, our table. We see that the friction loss is the greatest there. The next two columns in green are the maximum main elevation and the minimum pump elevation. These were input into the zone information for, on the zone information slide. And the static head calculation is really just the difference between the maximum and the minimum value. And it might be easier to visualize. Uh, since the lowest pump in zone one is at 10 feet, for argument's sake, let's just say that's 10 feet uh, above sea level. And the main elevation, say, uh, at the road is uh, at 40 feet above sea level, then the 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 pump has to pump vertically for, or 30 feet up to, to pump from the pump station into, uh, into the main. The final column on design page one is, is the, the sum of the accumulated friction loss and the static head to create the total dynamic head. Again, let's look at zone one. Accumulated friction loss is 76.66 feet. And then our static head is 30 feet. When we add the two together, that's the origin of our total dynamic head number. And you can do that for any of the other zones uh, along the way. I think we're doing great. Let's keep going. So we've completed design page one and let's move on to design page two. So again, design page two provides the accumulated retention time measured in hours and you can view it by selecting the tab and the tab is circled in red there. The first several columns in red and green boxes are, are reference information, and we've already really reviewed them. The first new column in dark blue is the calculation of the holding volume per, per 100 units of pipe. And again, this is kind of an incremental step again. Uh, and here in the purple box, we see the um, uh, length of, of, of uh, pipe in that particular zone. And again, back to, the, uh, back to the blue one, the volume in this pipe. So if I took 100 feet of two inch pipe, uh, HDPE SDR11, and I plugged one end, I could pour 15.4 gallons of milk uh, into that piece of pipe. That's how much it would, it would hold. So following on with design page two, uh, in red, we now see the capacity of, of this zone. So we take, we take that calculation, the, uh, the capacity in that section of pipe, and now we multiply it by the actual length of that, that zone. Uh, the green column is the average daily flow through that zone, uh, which is the multiplication of the accumulated uh, pumps in the zone uh, and the uh, daily, excuse me, the number of pumps in that zone and the uh, flow per day per dwelling that we selected in the zone information. So as a reminder, uh, in the example that we've been doing, we use 200 gallons per day per dwelling. And if we, you recall, there are three pumps in zone one. Therefore, the daily flow is 200 gallons per day times three pumps, thus 600 gallons per day is our flow through that pipe. The next column in blue is the average fluid changes per day, which is really just the flow per day divided by the capacity of, of the zone. So back to zone one, 600 gallons per day are traveling through that zone and the pipe can physically hold 31.58 gallons. So if I divide 600 by 31.58, I get 19. So the fluid is exchanged through that pipe 19 times per day. Then in purple, the average retention time is the number of hours in a day divided by the number of fluid changes that day. So 24 divided by 19 is 1.26. So the fluid in that pipe will be exchanged 
uh, every 1.26 hours. And then the yellow column is the accumulated retention time, which is the sum of the retention time in that zone plus any downstream zone. And, and similar to the total dynamic head, the retention time is going to be greatest in zones farthest away from the discharge point. We see that here, zone one, 7.46 hours. Um, it's going to take the longest that that flow has to travel through the most amount of pipe in order to get to that discharge point. So let's review a few more details about uh, the uh, design pages. On either design sheet, design page one or design page two, the software allows the user to modify the pipe sizing from a drop-down menu. Uh, upon changing the pipe size, uh, the software will automatically recalculate the fields. Pipe sizing seeks to achieve a balance between three key elements, total dynamic head, flow velocity, and retention time. For the TDH, our objective is to remain below 185 feet or 56 meters of TDH, where lower is generally better. Lower TDH reduces the load and wear on the pump and prolongs service life. Flow velocity is what helps to ensure any solids in the slurry remain in suspension and build up on the wall of the pipe is self-cleaned. This is often referred to as self-scouring and industry accepted minimum velocity is 2 feet per second or 0 0.6 meters per second. Finally, we want to minimize retention times. Acceptable, acceptable retention times vary from region to region, uh, but we like to provide general guidance, say that um, below four hours is ideal, four to eight hours has a risk of odor, and greater than eight hours will have a, a higher risk of odors. And depending on the project particulars, it might be advisable to, uh, to include odor control measures at the discharge point if there aren't already some there. When modifying pipe sizing, the software will highlight in red that they are below the recommended values. And that's what's shown here on these two slides. We see our total dynamic head uh, in the red boxed column is above 185 feet. And in the green box, we see that our velocity has dropped below two feet per second. Besides technical objectives, pipe sizing can also be modified for regulatory or logistical reasons. Uh, for example, there may be a requirement for minimum pipes diameter in a certain area under a roadway or a rail, rail line. Also, commercially, certain pipe diameters may not be readily available. The flexibility of the software allows the designer or engineer to essentially modify the network to evaluate the impact of those changes. The contractor comes to you and says, three inch pipe or fittings are in short supply and can use two and a half instead. We can quickly and easily find out. E1 Design Assistant includes an iterate function, which can help optimize the system. I wanted to make special mention of this feature in this webinar because the function can be misused. The iterate function can be used after the initial design calculations have been completed. The function modifies the flow rate on the zone information page to better reflect the flow rate associated with the TDH for pumps in that particular zone. Because the TDH is a function of flow rate, this calculation is recursive or a circular reference, and the function must iterate a few times to find an op optimal value. The result may be a more accurate TDH. However, the iterate function rarely impacts the overall study, the iterate function should only be used once per study. Do not keep pressing the iterate function. It's not, necess not necessary to iterate most designs, and E1 does caution it's used in most situations. Let's keep going. Referring back to the menu bar, we can select the cost information, which will provide the user with access to a bill of materials. After a completed study, design assistant will autofill the pipe tab with the lengths of pipe used. The user can then customize the bill of materials by adding grinder pump station details, details about valves, cleanouts, air releases, isolation. Note design assistant does not provide a quantity, location, or recommendation for valves. It's really up to the users to manually input those valves and values. From the cost information menu, the user can modify installation costs, but to modify unit supply cost, you must use the edit price description option. The report menu option will compile the pages for the report into, uh, for you to review. Most projects contain five sheets, the cover page, the cost analysis, uh, our friends design page one and two, and the project information page, which includes those notes from the project information tab. To print reports, the most efficient method is to select file and print reports option. If you need to print the entire report, select the print range of one through five as circled on the screenshot. 
As a note, if you do print to a PDF, Design Assistant 9 will create a separate file for each page, and, and the pages must then be compiled manually into a single report. We're almost to the end, and I wanted to wrap up with a few uh, tips or tricks. There's a lot of them out there, um, but some of these I wanted to mention and didn't really fit anywhere else. First, if you're working on a large project, say with 30 or 50 or more zones, it might be beneficial to turn off the auto calculate function when making any input changes. Uh, you can select that from the, uh, uh, the uh, analysis menu and deselect auto calculate. Once you're done with your changes, turn it back on. What it does is it can prevent a lag between each change as the software recalculates the impacted fields. Uh, if you need to make that global pipe size, again, say you find out three inches not available, you can use the global pipe size change uh, and under the uh, analysis menu. And finally, that edit price description will allow you to really customize the bill of material items to explicitly state maybe the E1 grinder pump model that was provided by your distributor uh, or any, any, any uh, information that, that is specific to your project. Wrapping up, thanks everyone for your time. And I really hope this was beneficial use of your time and you have a better appreciation of how Design Assistant helps you. Also, I, I hope we've cleared up any misconception about what Design Assistant does and does not do. Design Assistant saves you time, creates consistent outputs, and generally makes E1 pressure sewers design a snap. Finally, if you need help, I suggest visiting the E1 Design Center for information on accessing the Design Assistant software, its sister application, the Lifecycle Cost Calculator. If you need assistance in designing your project, E1 would be happy to help. Finally, E1's website, access e E1's website to access the catalog uh, and loads of additional information, webinars, video case studies, all sorts of resources. With that, we have Mike Crowley and Nick Shaparsek from our applications engineering team on the line. I'll hand it back over to you, Rach, and let's answer any questions. Okay, great. Thanks, Derek, for that very informative an enthusiastic presentation. Um, we did have uh, a bunch of questions come in, but first I just wanted to alert the audience uh, as a reminder that they'll receive a copy of this presentation as well as a certificate of attendance and a link to download the software. And uh, a couple questions have come in regarding uh, distribution and uh, various points around the world. We'll take those offline and we'll be contacting you directly regarding those questions. Um, so let's get right into it, uh, Derek, Mike, and Nick. Uh, why does E1 not recommend loop systems, such as water systems do, to provide a degree of reliability in the event of a pipe outage? You know, really, uh, you know, and I'd be happy if, if Mike and Nick uh, want to chime in on this as well. Uh, really, we want flow to go in, in one direction. Uh, part, of the, part of the risk that you face with loop systems uh, is that we can have, you can, you can create dead zones. Flow is always going to travel to the path of least resistance. And if we have a loop, it's, it's, the flow is going to go in one direction or the other. And we really can't guarantee which direction it travels. So um, by, by preventing loops, uh, we ensure that flow travels travels in one direction. We ensure that our pipe sizing is accurate based on the flow that's going to go through through that zone. Um, you know, and, and uh, you know, uh, mileage may vary around the world, but, um, you know, pressure sewer systems, especially those built with HDPE, are, are pretty reliable uh, systems and, uh, and, and, and breakages are, on the whole, are, are pretty rare. So having that contingency, while, um, you know, might make sense and say water networks doesn't really serve, uh, you know, there's, there's enough, uh, technical downsides that I don't think it, it warrants the, the insurance policy, so to speak. Um, I don't know, Nick, Mike, do you guys have anything to add? I think uh, Derek, can... oh. <laughs> one at a time. I'll go first. One thing I'd like to mention is that uh, in a looping system, it's very, very difficult to determine retention time uh, because you could have the sewage being pumped one way and then the other way. And it, it's very difficult to determine how long it will take for it to get to the discharge. Thanks, Nick. Anything to add, Mike? We're good. Uh, yeah, I'd also say that um, <clears throat> you want to make sure the goal ultimately with a pressure sewer system is to get wastewater from point A to point B, you know, out of the collection system to treatment. And if you have a loop and wastewater can effectively circulate, you're potentially not going to do that. So. Uh, a loop, there should never be a loop in a pressure sewer. 
Um, only time you would ever see that on a drawing would be is if you, you know, had a valve to, sh you know, isolate a section of a loop and were able to direct flow in either direction. Okay, thanks guys. Um, what criteria is used to define a zone? Uh, Derek, in the example you used, it appears that zone one and two could be combined due to simple links, meaning no branch connections, unless there are other criteria that, uh, that would prohibit this combination. Any thoughts there? Yeah, so real quick, you know, uh, again, we didn't, we didn't go into detail about the zone designation process, but, but E1 creates zones whenever a change in flow is likely to occur. Um, and changes in flow occur for, for essentially two reasons. One is a branch connection. We have, we have branch A uh, coming in with so many pumps and branch B coming in with a no different number of pumps connecting to a common point to create branch C. And the flow through branch C will be the sum of, of those two. But in E1 with our simultaneous operation model, the other time that um, flow will change is when we have another, we, we reach that next level of simultaneous operations um, where our statistical model says that uh, up to up to three, three pumps in, in a zone, simultaneously there'll be two pumps operating simultaneously. The simultaneous operation chart then says with nine total pumps, we'll have three. Um, so it, it comes down to how that simultaneous operation um, model works. So, so zone changes aren't necessarily where branches occur. It can also be where, where the flow changes because we have more simultaneous operations occurring. Okay, thank you for that. Let's uh, discuss a little something called H2S. Uh, do you ever consider this in the force main? You know, sure. So H2S is, is one of the reasons why we look at retention time. Um, and, you know, generally uh, the H2S, uh, excuse me, generally uh, in, in the pressure sewer system will have some anaerobic conditions. There might be H2S in the pipeline, but really the concern is what happens at, at the discharge. Um, going back at the point of origin in the grinder pump stations themselves, uh, E1 systems are designed to cycle frequently. So we don't have much if any hydrogen sulfide or, or odors created at that site. Um, once, once we enter the pipeline and we're in this, uh, we're in this uh, anaerobic condition, not a lot happens there. The, the real trick is what happens at that discharge point. Um, and, and that's where that kind of general guidance, and it really varies by region about what, what the risk of, uh, of that H2S is at that, that discharge point. Um, and, and again, uh, sometimes there's nothing you can do about long retention times. It, it could be a, a factor of the number of connections and, and, the, and the pumping distance, the size of the project in general. And really the guidance that we can provide is we, we know the retention time is going to be long enough that hydrogen sulfide creation may be a concern. And depending on the discharge uh, type and and if it's uh, if it's a manhole or into a treatment plant, you know we might be able to provide guidance that hey there might be a higher risk of hydrogen sulfide of odors or even corrosion at this this discharge point. Um, we are going to recommend to the engineer to consider mitigation measures, whether it's odor filtration, whether it's 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 lining of a, of a discharge or concrete manhole or something like that. So we can really provide that guidance with the retention time calculation. Thanks, Derek. Uh, and here's a here's a good question. Um, please address maintenance of the common force main. For example, how often for flushing for routine maintenance? Yeah, it really depends. Um, U1 doesn't doesn't necessarily provide uh, guidance. It really depends uh, on 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 regions. Uh, part of our recommendations are to include. Uh, flushing connections or clean out connections really to provide the system operator with the ability to clean those mains. Uh, in general, a properly designed pressure sewer system shouldn't really require uh, much maintenance on, on the mains themselves. You know, really oftentimes um, the, the, the primary maintenance that's performed on a main is in the event of, of unauthorized digging. Um, there are there could be situations depending on um, you know long periods of of inactivity or things like that that the main may need to be flushed, um, and flushing recommendations therefore are are going to be on a on a on a project by project basis to to determine uh, whether or not that that's really necessary. Okay, thanks, Derek. Does the software take into account the location of the maximum elevation? 
it appeared to just assume it's at the end of the zone. Mike or Nick, do you guys want to take that? Yeah, I'll take that one. Uh, you, the data you enter is the maximum elevation of the main in each zone. And when you actually run the calculation, a design assistant looks, uh, looks forward toward the discharge and it takes into account uh, the maximum main elevation that's the highest on the path between that zone and the discharge. So uh, the total static head does get accounted for by design assistant. And when it, when it makes that correction for you, uh, it'll come up with a, a little message saying that it corrected some elevations. Thank you, Nick. Um, this attendee didn't hear anything about cleanouts, so sorry if they missed it. But does E1 recommend cleanouts in the pressure sewer? Is there a length of pipe off one grinder pump that we would consider using cleanouts? Mike, what are our cleanout recommendations? General recommendations for cleanouts on a pressure sewer system would be at all branch ends and all branch junctions. And a branch would be a section of piping with multiple grinder pumps on it. Um, and on a uh, long length of pipe without any, um, you know, branches, you would want to have a clean out or flushing connection every thousand feet or so, plus or minus. Anyone provide some standard detail on um, you know, the, the, the look of a, of a flushing connection? Generally, they can use uh, commodity uh, fittings and, and valves and things like that supplied by the contractor. Thank you, Mike and Derek. Um, how would you account for sizing where, uh, where a project uh, is being done in phases, the construction over it over a long period of time? I'll, I can handle that one. Uh, so generally when, you, when you're talking about phasing, uh, depending on how long it takes, you can either design the system for full build out and anticipate maybe having to do some extra maintenance flushing of the lines before full build out or as some alternatives that we've seen and designed have been running parallel force mains to each section uh, to make sure that the flows are high enough to avoid high retention times throughout the whole build out process. Thanks, Nick. Uh, what is the impact of a system uh, being stagnant for several months due to seasonal occupancy? Um, for instance, this is a primary summer residence area impact on individual pump and on pipes due to lack of flow for several months? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, it's, it's something that E1 has to face frequently because uh, pressure sewer systems are, tip, are, are frequently used in, uh, in areas, remote areas uh, where it might be difficult to construct, uh, certainly uh, seasonal areas, uh, lakeside, uh, oceanside areas where we see big swings in, in seasonal occupancy. Um, and part of the design uh, criteria of our product is we know that the system is going to be subjected to it. You know, some of the earliest uh, pressure sewer systems were for, you know, fishing cabins way out in the middle of nowhere. So it, inherently in the grinder pump station, you know, the, the system is, is designed to be able to sit dormant for long periods of time. Um, part of the benefit too of having a progressive cavity pump is even if we do get some buildup, uh, some of, uh, you know, we don't reach that flushing velocity that, that we talked uh, uh, about during the presentation and that's codified, you know, two feet per second, 0.6 meters per second, even if we get some buildup, um, the, the E1 progressive cavity grinder pump is able to continue to create a uh, constant flow rate. So even if we get a slight constriction uh, in a pipe or we have solid settle out in a pipeline, the, the grinder pump will continue to produce a, a constant flow rate through a smaller cross-sectional area. So we'll actually end up uh, self or achieving that scouring velocity through that restricted pipe. E1 grinder pumps also have reserve hydraulic capacity. So even if we're operating slightly above that, that performance point, we're able to kind of muscle through uh, pipes at that time. But look, in, in, in complete transparency, uh, you know, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not impossible that a pressure sewer system may have to be periodically flushed um, either before, um, you know, when, when winterizing an area, so to speak, uh, or when, uh, or, or when the, uh, the high, high season is about to, to pick off. Not common, but uh, again, it's not without, uh, without precedence or outside of the realm of possibilities. Okay, thank you. Uh, Derek, can you provide further explanation for how uh, 
SIMOP numbers are calculated based on number of grinder pumps selected or direct me to where more explanation of this can be provided. Uh, yeah, sure. So um, I, uh, first, uh, visit the E1 uh, Design uh, Center uh, on the E1 website. If you go to E1 Sewer Systems, there, there'll be an option to go to the Design Center. Uh, from there, you can look at the um, uh, the uh, low pressure sewer system design manual. Uh, even if you download the software, uh, you're provided with a copy of of that manual, which includes that that simultaneous operations uh, table. If I um, just just because if I'm good enough here, I'll back up quickly to the SIMOPS table. Um, I've, now I've done it, sorry. There we go. Uh, so this is the simultaneous operations table. Uh, and again, uh, this is based on empirical data. Um, and, and again, uh, kind of uh, uh, routinely used and, 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 and routinely proven. So again, within, within a given area, uh, the column on the left represents the number of pumps connected. And the column on the right is the number of pumps that are gonna operate simultaneously. So we had that question earlier about zone division. So, you know, the first zone that was shown on that example, uh, in, you know, we'll, we'll admit there's a little bit of shorthand. We, we typically uh, skip that first zone and we, we start with the first, um, up to three pumps will create the first zone. And with three connected pumps, the the statistical model tells us that at, at maximum two will operate uh, at the same time. Uh, so that's our first zone. Um, and then we know as soon as we have four or more pumps, so as soon as that fourth pump hits, statistically, there's the likelihood that three will operate simultaneously. Uh, and likewise, uh, as soon as we get more than nine, uh, and, and we're in the 10 to 18 range, we'll have four operating simultaneously. I'll admit um, this, this is probably one of the, um, one of the more uh, abstract or, or, or um, uh, uh, interesting things, the unique things uh, to grasp. But once you, once you kind of understand the simultaneous concept, uh, everything starts to, to make a lot more sense. So uh, I would recommend, uh, you know, hopefully my explanation helped whoever asked that question, or also uh, looking at some of the reference materials uh, available from E1, or following up uh, again with, uh, with a local distributor or E1 directly, we can, we can provide more one-on-one uh, -on -one input. Thank you, Derek. Um, what is the life expectancy of a grinder pump? Yeah, so I'll take that. So, um, you know, we look at field data, we've got hundreds of thousands of units uh, across the uh, across the world. Uh, really, the, the our expectation and the feedback we get from the field is we expect a, an eight to 10 year uh, mean time between service call. Um, that's not that's not the point at where that's not the life of the pump necessarily, but that's the service interval of the pump. So at that eight to 10 year interval, keep in mind no preventative maintenance is required to that point but at that eight to ten year interval that's the point at which the wearing items of the pump uh, should be replaced the design life of the pump uh, is in excess of 25 years and, and in fact we've got plenty of examples of of e1 grinder pumps far exceeding uh, that as well so really we expect an e1 grinder pump to uh, to be able to have um, you know two maybe even three uh, services uh, within its life before being replaced and um, just a clarification question here. Design assistance software only accounts for major friction losses, ignoring minor losses? Yeah, that's, that's correct. Yeah, there's, enough, there's enough conservative factors taken into account uh, with some of our assumptions that a lot of those, a lot of those uh, uh, minor losses can be, can be uh, disregarded. Uh, we've seen plenty of, plenty of people include them, but really at the end of the day, the results are, are, are pretty similar. Okay, uh, what is the longest run supportable by the output capacity of an E1 grinder pump before a pumping station needs to be installed to augment flow to a gravity flow destination or the treatment station? I can take this one. Um, if it's a single pump running through a standard discharge line, uh, the limit is about two miles on flat ground. But the moment it gets any more complex than that, uh, it's really a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, we've seen systems that are, you know, five, six miles from the furthest pump to the discharge. Uh, there's, the, a f there's a factor involved where as your pipe sizing gets bigger, your friction losses are lower per foot. So 
very large subdivisions can often be pumped a very far distance to a treatment plant, whereas smaller ones maybe not so far uh, without needing uh, extensive, you know, flushing of the lines uh, due to oversizing, et cetera. And to kind of expand upon that, um, also, um, as Nick said, you know, with a larger system, it's easier to get into a larger pipe size and pump a longer distance. And there's also factors that will affect that, such as what is the terrain doing along that distance? You know, is there a lot of static head to deal with? Is it flat ground? And also what type of piping are you using? You know, all those things, you know, can have an impact. And as well as, you know, in some cases, regulatory requirements. So for example, a Hazen Williams C factor of 150 versus 120 over a five, six mile run can have a substantial impact on what that might look like. Thank you, all three of you. Um, do you calculate the static head from the inlet and outlet elevations, or do you look at low and high points along the pipes? Uh, we generally just use surface elevations uh, for our analysis because that's the data we often have from either uh, LIDAR or just topographical maps of the area. E1 uh, systems generally aren't, uh, don't have the same depth requirements as gravity. So uh, surface elevation is a good approximation for the actual elevation and the differences um, are minimal. And it's also a good way to be uh, consistent with the elevations you're using. Um, to, you know, Nick also mentioned, you know, depth is certainly a consideration, but you know, you have to consider there may be some variability between uh, where an inlet or outlet of a grinder pump station may end up when it's on paper versus when a contractor goes to put it in in the field. You know, a couple of shovels full of gravel or, you know, a, a culvert pipe that wasn't on a drawing or a buried, you know, gas line or an existing tank or something that was just not planned for, you know, that can totally change things and that can make a big difference in what your calculation ends up looking like. Okay, thank you guys. Um, what is the maximum velocity for design of E1 sewers? I would say generally um, five to six feet per second would be the maximum. Any higher than that and flow becomes very turbulent. And um, the few things you wanna consider there are when you're discharging to a gravity line, manhole pump station or you know anything for that matter, um, you run the risk of you know, wear and tear in your existing infrastructure downstream equipment, uh, odor generation you know, with a lot of splash. Um, uh, so I would say generally five to six would be the max. Any higher than that, you know, your friction loss factors are gonna go through the roof. Um, personally, I generally try to stay in the two to four to five feet per second range you now at the most. Okay, thanks, Mike. Um, where would air relief valves be placed? General rule of thumb for air relief valves would be every 2,000 to 2,500 feet on a run without a defined high point or it changes in grade of 20 to 25 feet or greater. And do you recommend check valves at branch connections? Branch connections as in a Branch with multiple pumps tying into a main, no. Uh, if you're talking about an individual grinder pump tying onto a common force main, then yes, those would be required. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, let's see, slightly off topic. Um, how would you determine, and Derek, this might be a question for you. How would you determine emergency storage required for a project? Uh, geez, that's a that's a tough one. It, you know, really, emergency storage is going to be um, if there is a requirement, it's going to be directed from some some sort of regulator uh, or some uh, from some standard. Um, depending depending where you are, you know, we've heard anything from four to twelve to twenty four hours, um, and you know, it, it's, it's, it's really all over the place. So I, I wish I had one answer, uh, but working in projects in uh, five different continents, uh, you, you get all sorts of, of, of different answers. 
uh, you know, uh, probably the flagship E1 product uh, for a point of information only has a 70 gallon wet well. Uh, and, uh, or, you know, in, in metric units, you know, that's, that's less than, less than 300 liters uh, of, of actual storage. So, uh, you know, some jurisdictions have, have very little requirement for emergency storage. And part of that could be built on the reliability uh, that, that's been demonstrated from, from E1. Uh, likewise, you get some, some jurisdictions that might have requirements for uh, 24 hours of, of storage. Um, and, and again, I guess uh, without um, uh, going on too many tangents, some of that um, uh, some of that could come into service level agreements, depending on who the operator is, uh, what the storage uh, volume is meant to mitigate. Uh, is, it, is it mitigating power outages? Uh, is it mitigating uh, uh, mechanical failures? And, and how is the operator poised to respond to, to any of those conditions? But again, the, the primary product that ships from E1 is a 70 gallon wet well. So storage, storage volumes in, in some areas are, uh, are, are quite low. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see, I think we're just about out of time. Um, we had a whole bunch of questions that we did not get to, so our apologies for that. We will answer each one individually in a follow-up email. Um, we thank you so much for your time and attention and interest today. This has really been a very rich discussion. Um, so on behalf of all of us at E1, we thank you for joining today's session and look forward to seeing you soon. Please reach out to us. Uh, we are more than happy to uh, answer your questions. As Derek mentioned, certainly um, work with you on your next uh, sewer design project. We are absolutely here to help. So thank you and be well. <laughs>